Dr. Espinoza is going to take this one. Is it a minute? Hi, everyone. All righty, so let's get to it. Um, these are my objectives. What is 8 times 8? It's kind of like the abbreviation. Where did this idea come from? Uh, is there any kind of data behind it? And then how much water do we really need? Has this really been studied? And uh, does it depend on like many other different variables, um, like regular water versus other types of beverages? And what are some proposed like benefits of drinking so much water? So eight by eight is eight, eight times a day, you should drink about eight ounces of water, which totals to about 1.9 liters per day, so half a gallon. And we're kind of going to discuss whether or not this uh, applies to just water, or can we also include like sodas or caffeinated drinks or whatnot? And does it apply equally across everyone, someone who's athletic, someone who's not? So in terms of the origin, from what I found, uh, back in 1945, the US Food and Nutrition Board of the National Research Council published a recommendation to do about one milliliter per kilocalorie ex of energy expended. So to be considered an energy balance, that would uh, uh, approximate 2,000 kilocalories per day, which would be about two liters per day. So then if you kind of think about it, like the math, that kind of goes back to the eight times eight. And this paper did say, you know, it could be um, from water, but plain water, but also from food, because we do get quite a bit of water from food. Another place that it could have come from was Dr. Frederick J. Stair, who was a very influential nutritionist. Um, this is a quote from the New York Times, actually. He also published a book regarding this. Um, this is actually a quote here um, describing where he kind of says more of an opinion that although the body does physiologically regulate our own water balance, around six to eight glasses of water per 24 hours is recommended, and that could be from coffee, tea, water, and or beer. It's Friday, happy hour. Another thing I got from the NHS, the UK's biggest health website, which still has this on their website, about six to eight glasses of water per day, 1.2 liters. But there doesn't really, they don't provide much of an actual article or evidence to kind of back this information up either. And neither did the book of um, Dr. Stare. So uh, I really like this study and I'd like to talk about it. Um, it went over, it's titled Variation Human Water Turnover associated with environmental and lifestyle factors. And this is a pretty good chart um, image that shows you that we get our water from you know, liquids, but also even metabolic processes that go on, um, as well as from food. So preformed water and food are major um, contributors to water intake. And this is how we also, um, right here shows how we get rid of our water, which is in stool, urine, sweat, respiratory water losses, but the what, respiratory water losses and transcutaneous processes are a little bit less. Um, so th this study aimed to kind of determine the dependence of water turnover and the total body water as how it influences with age, the body size, your um, activity level, the altitude, the temperature outside. Um, and water turnover um, is the water used by the body each day intake and loss measured in liters per day. So that'll be like a good reflection of what our water intake should be. And this study, this was recent actually, November 24th, 2022, um, with I believe, what is it, 5,600 participants from 26 different countries. They used the hydrogen isotope dilution method. Uh, so in brief, they kind of give the uh, deuter deuteridium whoa, way off, um, deuterium, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> um, floods the body, and then they kind of get this, a, they get this constant um, or coefficient of when it kind of goes back to baseline when it drops, and they use that to kind of calculate the water turnover. So from that, they were able to graph these pretty cool images. Right here on the left, we see, um, our y-axis being age and water turnover on the y-axis. And they saw that individual in males, 20 to 30, that's when you saw the highest water turnover. And in women, you have 20 to 55 being the highest of the water turnover. And then it also graphed here in the seasons. In the summertime, you're gonna have a higher water turnover, which kind of makes sense. It's a higher, a hotter climate versus your spring. 
over here, we have other great um, graphs showing um, dividing between athleticism, occupation, um, your physical activity level, and the air temperature outside. So on average, um, athletes will have a higher water turnover than the non-athletes. Those who are hunter-gatherers and those who are farmers and hunter-gatherers will have a higher water turnover than those who are not. As well as with, um, you see a kind of positive correlation as well. With the air temperature rising, you get a more water turnover use as well as physical activity level. From all this data, they were able to come up with this pretty gnarly equation. So to kind of calculate your water turnover, um, not to get all into the details of it, but for example, if 20 year old weighing 70 kilos, that's not super active, will have a water turnover about 3.2. And if he changes kilos to 60, he'll drop to 2.7. So again, weight also contributing to your water turnover. And uh, water turnover does encompass the transcutaneous um, water uptake as well as respiratory and metabolic water about 15%. So if you want to calculate what you take in orally from like foods and water, you just, um, they calculated that to be about 85%. So if you were to use that equation and plug those numbers in and get 85% from the previous uh, example, that'd be about 2.7 to 2.3 liters of water uptake per day from either just plain fluids and or um, foods. Um, so pretty much in summary, the 8x8 does not really cast a blanket term for everybody. Everyone's different depending on your physical activity level and where you're living. Um, and they came up with that equation pretty much as well. I got curious to see, like, well, just let me just check up to date real quick. What does that say? Well, if we're doing maintenance fluids, someone who's not in otherwise septic shock, who's otherwise normal, you're just trying to give them some fluids. Well, they said your, your minimal urine output should be 500 a day. And um, other things considered with like about approximate 800 milliliters of water from food and from 300 from oxidation, um, that accounts maybe 1.6 per day. And they recommend to do about two liters per day of one half isotonic saline. Again, kind of hitting the same numbers from the previous study. Um, there's this book in 2005, Dietary Reference Intakes, um, that touched a little bit also upon the urine output requirements, and they also kind of stated that the minimum urine output should be about 500 milliliters per day to get a, to be considered like an electrolyte um, balance. Uh, you should be putting out about 650 milliosmoles of electrolytes. And so with their calculations, um, if they were to, um, have like maximum urine um, osmolality, then you should put at least 500 of urine output a day. But we, on average, per this chart over here as well, we put on at least one to two liters per day. So we're pretty well hydrated. Um, they also talked about using balanced studies, what are our total requirements of water intake? Um, so right here we have again more charts kind of showing what on average we should be taking in. So for most adult men, the minimal should be 2.1, on average 3.4. Um, and let's see, and then other studies by Johnson in 1964, again, water requirements of at least 0 0.9 liters to up to three if you're in the hot climate. They concluded, again, depending on you know, the individual person, where they're living, the physical activity level, it all varies. Um, here, some of their like uh, recommended adequate intakes are listed for men about 2,500 milliliters per day and in women two, uh, two liters per day. These were also based off of water studies using the D2O isotope of water. I thought this study was pretty interesting. Um, they used the neuroendocrine plasma, uh, marker plasma arginine vasopressor, pressin. Um, it's a water regulating hormone. It keeps your uh, serum osmolal plasma osmolality in check. So they wanted to kind of find the threshold at to which the plasma arginine vasopressin kind of kicks in to keep all this water regulation intact. So, um, you know, they wanted to get the total water intake to see what the requirements would be in conjunction with the AVP thresholds. Um, and let's go into that real quick. 
So we have some pretty great charts here. This right here is the, on the left we have the plasma osmolality, and then on the y-axis we have the plasma AVP. So as you can see, as plasma osmolality increases, you're gonna have a rise in your AVP, which kicks in. And the regular black dots are the normal uh, subjects. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the polydipsia, primary polydipsia and nephrogenic GI, which are all these other lines, but um, as you can see here, we kind of hit this like exponential uprise at around plasma osmolality around 290. And then on this chart right here, you have AVP on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, you have your urine osmolality. And right here, around the plasma AVP of around two, you start to notice like an uprise in your urine osm. This was pretty interesting. So this is an eight-day um, study. These people with the black squares, they at baseline drink about 3.2 liters per day. These folks up here drink on average 1.4 liters per day, I believe. Um, so they were on a seat. Let's see what their plasma levels of AVP are at 8 a.m. in the morning. So as you can kind of imagine, those who drink a lot of water at baseline have low AVP levels. Those who don't drink a lot of water at baseline have higher AVP levels. So then around day after day three, they're like, switch. If you're a low drinker, drink what the higher people are drinking. If you're a higher drinker, drink what the lower people are drinking. And so we kind of get this like inverse, these flip numbers. And right here where they cross is around 1.8 to 2 of the AVP, which tells us that, or what the study was saying is, it kind of tells us that your happy medium is between these two um, averages. So if you're drinking anywhere between the 3.2 to the 1.6 liters, you should be at eudration. And sorry, I kind of just said what this slide said, is that um, eudration is established to be around 1.8 to 2 liters. So again, although it's not a blanket term, these numbers are sort of similar to the whole 8 by 8, but again, this just doesn't include all the other factors like foods and waters and all that stuff. I uh, kind of want to talk about a little bit, let's see, some folks are told to drink a lot more water to prevent certain types of illnesses or to help with their chronic conditions. So this study was pretty interesting. Um, as we kind of discussed about AVP being high in those who are not at eudration, um, in pa patients with polycystic kidney disease, we have um, arginine vasopressin, which is known to promote the cell proliferation and cyst formation. So they were thinking, can we tell these patients to, can we kind of tell them to drink enough water to suppress AVP and maybe decrease the progression of renal decline and cyst formation? So they used a urine osmolality to uh, gauge um, increase in water intake. And after three years of follow-up, there was no difference in cyst growth on MRI or the progression of um, renal decline. Here is another paper that kind of gives a brief evidence of um, many other studies as well. As um, many of us know that if you are a stone former, a kidney stone former, you're encouraged to drink a lot of water, but it's not necessarily the amount you take in, it's the amount you should put out. So uh, I think it's agreed upon that anywhere between two to 2.5 liters of urine output should be adequate to kind of prevent recurrence of urolithiasis. Um, and then they touch base upon um, whether or not increasing water intake would lead to a slower decline in, re uh, in renal decline, sorry. Um, and this Canadian study and some Australian and American cohort studies also did show that there was some type of correlation between increasing water intake and a slower renal decline, but in this study, the Australian and American cohorts, um, there was negative effects if you were using sweetened beverages and their beneficial effects were mostly seen with just plain water. But I believe these were mostly observational studies, um, if I'm not mistaken. And then there was also another uh, pretty good observation in the late 1990s in South Mexico and Central America of uh, sugarcane workers where they noticed that um, there was like a, a trend in CKD going on. And then they, although we know that it's many other aspects are going on as well, we can kind of uh, hypothesize sort of that 
It's the chronic dehydration and the stress that they're working in that kind of causes these hypoperfusion states leading to eventual CKD. So I think the main purpose of this paper was, or this review, uh, was kind of to note that increasing water requirements can maybe be a beneficial in the long term to prevent um, kidney injury. Um, oh, and this one I thought was interesting. Um, I know some folks think drinking more water can lead to decreased rates of like UTIs or other conditions, but according to this paper that I got um, published in 2011, the evidence for preventing a UTI with increased water intake was actually very weak. The only strong evidence they found was to prevent urolithiasis, as we discussed previously. And then last, um, this last paper that I want to talk about um, was pretty interesting as well. They had patients who had CKD stage 3, and they wanted to increase their water requirements by 1 to 1.5 liters per day to see if it would slow the uh, progression of CKD. Uh, but the primary outcome was a change in GFR, and the secondary outcome was changes in plasma copeptin, which is like a similar to AVP, and creatinine clearance, and 24-hour urine albumin. The results were that coaching to increase water intake did not significantly slow the decline in kidney function in patients with CKD stage 3 at one-year follow-up, um, which is kind of, you know. Anyways, in summary. We know we've gone over kind of like how much water we should take in. The numbers vary. Um, they can be higher if you're in higher climates and physically active, lower if you're not. Um, and you, we need it kind of, I think we kind of dispel the fact that it has to be just water. It can include other beverages as well. Um, and it also comes a lot from food. Um, some studies show higher urine volume um, is associated with lower renal decline, and there's no evidence to suggest that water intake decreases cysts and autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, and there is no universal census to apply to set a volume intake. Anybody have any questions or comments about anything? So what are you gonna tell your patients in the clinic when they ask you about like eight cups of water a day? I will tell them, you should drink when your body tells you you are thirsty. And if anything, you should increase your vegetables and fruits, because that contains like 99% water. Unless your A1C is at a certain number, maybe we don't want so much fruit, you know? Any other comments? That sort of relates to what I had on my next slide, which is, what would Franklin do? Well, you know, animals, dogs, people, you know, we have thirst mechanism for a reason. It tells us that we need to drink, right? So, you know, Franklin drinks when he, most of the time when he's thirsty. He's very healthy. I think most of us do that. Um, so there's really not much, you know, evidence, I don't think, from the data that's been presented that two liters or eight glasses a day is some magic number. It all is going to depend on how much activity you're doing, how hot it is outside, lots and lots of factors. I'm, I, Dr. Fitzgibbon's zooming in. She's not here, but I'm sure when she runs a marathon, she drinks a hell of a lot more than two liters of water um, that day. So, you know, your thirst mechanism was, has evolved to tell us when we should drink our, our Os plasma osmolarity, our electrolytes are very finely regulated in our bodies and our, you know, those mechanisms have been evolved over a million years or more. So I think, you know, most of the time Franklin does drink when he's thirsty. I have to say he's more like a person, you know, like in the ICU, the nurses, a lot of times they don't have time to go to the bathroom. They don't have time to drink anything. They don't really have access so they're carrying around these things to sip all the time. Um, Franklin, similarly, actually, when my wife and I go away from the house, if he, um, even though we leave water for him all over the house, we have multiple bowls of water that are full when we leave, 
we come home and he hasn't drunk any of it. And as soon as we walk in the door, he runs over and he starts guzzling water. I think he's learned that if he's inside that he can't go out and pee if he drinks a lot of water and he just, he just doesn't drink until we get home. It's kind of remarkable actually. So animals are pretty smart too, especially Franklin. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Sri. Does darker yellow urine mean we're dehydrated? Yes. <laughs> well, I should have let you do that. Well, I don't know. Um, I did think about that too, and I didn't dive into the color of urine, but also, you know, some folks will drink all these vitamins and they're like, but I'm still peeing like Gatorade color and I need to drink more water, but it's because your kidneys are filtering out what you don't need. But at that's maybe different than... No, I think, like, yeah, I mean, I think certain foods are going to change the color of your urine. But in general, yeah, that's true, that if your urine is very light colored, it's less concentrated. Um, if it's yellow, darker yellow, it tends to be more concentrated. And there actually were some studies where they actually looked at urine color so and, uh, and correlated that. So I think that is generally true. Yeah, there's somebody in the back. Like news notifications a few weeks ago because the NIH had published this huge cohort study in like a Lancet related journal called like e Biomedicine, I think. Oh dear. Um, they did this cohort study of like 11,000 people and looked at the association of serum sodium with um, mm. biological aging and chronic disease, and it was like all over the news because it, you know, the headline is. Better hydration lowers your risk of heart disease and dementia and early death. So that was just something that I felt like was in the media a lot, and maybe patients would ask about it. Maybe not like a lot of our patients, but it, it was an interesting study. And um, I, I think, yeah, I don't really have much else to say. I was hoping someone smarter than me would have something to say about that. Do you have anything to say? I do, but you, I, go ahead. No, I, I didn't read the article. I didn't, I didn't read the article either. That. Hey, I didn't read the article. I don't know what kind of study it was. Um, if it's one of these population studies, um, that's not any kind of control. There are so many confounding factors in those studies. Um, as you could see from the equation that he showed about water balance or water turnover, mm -hmm. which is water balance, um, there's you know at least seven or eight different factors involved. So. My guess is just because you ask a lot of people how much water they drink, those people may also be the ones that are out exercising the most and needing more water, and that's why they're drinking more water, and that's why they're also healthier because they're not, because they are out exercising instead of sitting on the couch. So, I mean, there's a lot of other factors. I don't know about the study. I didn't read it, so I'm just speculating. I, I mean, they're not asking people how much water they're drinking. They did like an analysis of 11,000. Uh, records from some database of the atherosclerosis risk in community study, I think, and they looked at serum sodium and m mortality rates, age, uh, and various chronic diseases like heart disease, heart failure, uh, de and dementia, and things. It was yeah, I don't know. I don't know the quality of the data that they're looking at, but okay. I, I can't comment on it. So. Okay. And I, you know, I this myth that we're examining is not should you drink a lot of water um, or does it really make a difference it's really you really need to eat, drink eight glasses you know of water per day to stay healthy and I think personally I think that's probably not necessarily true and it may be that you need a lot more than that on an individual basis so Sorry, Dr. Free. Huh? it looks like they used uh, high normal versus low normal serum sodium as a surrogate for hydration. So uh, if anything, that supports your theory about people's thirst mechanisms. Okay. Um, thank you. All right, so we're going to vote now. Obviously, there's some controversy here. So um, this is what we're voting on. Uh, how many people think that this is true, that this is what people should be doing? You should be advising everybody to do this. How many think it's plausible? How many think this is busted? Wow, it's pretty unanimous, I think. Yeah? I think so. All right. <laughs>
All right, we're busted. <laughs>